Conference of evidence. That. Preponderance of evidence. If you're considering what preponderance of evidence looks like, think about the scales and think about having equal amounts of grains of sand on each side of the scale, on each plate of the scale, and then adding one more grain of sand to one side that's not on the other. And the, tail, the scales are going to actually tip in favor of the side that has that one extra grain of sand. That's a preponderance of the weight, which is a preponderance of evidence example for you. So you don't have to convince anybody very much. You just have to convince them more likely than not that this happened. Now that's the, that's the easiest burden of proof in civil procedure. Like I said, it's probably going to apply to about 90% of your cases. Um, and because the only thing at issue in civil cases usually is money. And if all you're talking about is money, then the court system says, if that's all that's at stake, then the only amounts of safeguards we have to put in place is a preponderance of evidence so that any, any finder of fact, trier of fact, whether it's a jury or a judge, only has to be reasonably satisfied that more likely than not, the plaintiff suffered the injury caused by the defendant. Whatever the injury was, if it's a breach of contract or a tort, whatever, it's going to be a preponderance of evidence. It's the only burden of proof the plaintiff has to meet in order to prove their case. Now, what about if custody of a child is at dispute? Do you think maybe that's a little bit more important than just money? Well, it's supposed to be more important. And if you practice in juvenile court, where you're talking about taking a child away from a parent because the parent has either abused, neglected, or abandoned the child, then a mere preponderance of evidence is not enough to deprive that parent of their constitutionally protected liberty <coughs> right to have custody and raise their child. So what they've done is they've come up with a heightened burden of proof and that's called clear and convincing evidence. And the rationale under Matthews versus Eldridge is you need to put in some additional safeguards here when you have a more important liberty interest or a more important interest. And the, the safeguard is to protect against an erroneous judgment. That's what Matthews versus Eldridge actually says is to pr protect against an erroneous judgment. So when it comes to custody of kids, courts typically apply the clear and convincing evidence standard, which is, it's greater than preponderance of evidence, isn't it? it has to be clear and convincing that this is what happened to the child. Not more likely than not, because if it's just more likely than not, you could be accidentally depriving a parent of their custody. But if it comes to the level of clear and convincing evidence, then you're pretty reasonably assured that this happened to the child and the child needs to be protected. Yes, ma'am. Could you give an example of that? Would that be like a parent who's seeing a certain situation with that endangered child? How about a mama takes her child to the crack house in order to get a, her next fix? from the law enforcement that arrested mama at the crack house with her baby there. That'd be pretty clear and convincing that mama probably at least neglected the child, if not abused the child, by taking the child to a crack house. Another example is mamas who teach their kids to shoplift so that if they get caught by security, they're just kids, they let them go, even though the kids are putting the merchandise in the baby stroller that mama's pushing. That's a real case too. That's, that's lots of real cases. Now, the third burden of proof is going to sound very familiar to those of you who have actually studied some criminal law and criminal procedure. And that is beyond a reasonable doubt. Y'all heard that before, right? Yeah. Okay, I can think of one example 
when beyond a reasonable doubt is required? And that is, if you're going to take a child away from a family that happens to be Native American, Indian, whether or not they're Alaskan Eskimos or Choctaw Indians, Porch Indians, to get a little bit closer to home, um, Cherokee, there's some Cherokee still here in Alabama. If you're going to take a child away from a family that's Indian, then there's actually federal law passed because there was an abuse in the system. They would be taking kids away from their Indian cultural heritage and placing them into homes where they were not learning of their Indian heritage. So the federal government passed a law called the Indian Child Welfare Act, which actually modifies every state's burden of proof. If you're taking a child who happens to be Indian or eligible to be on the roster as an Indian child and placing them in another home, actually requires you contact the tribe. But before you can remove the, the child from the home, it has to be beyond a reasonable doubt that the child is abused or neglected. Yes? Does that, does that only apply in federal court or does it apply in state court? It applies in state court too. It's a federal law that overrides state law. And there's only a few federal laws that really override state law. Another one is a Service Member Civil Relief Act that you can't get a judgment against somebody who's actually on active duty. Federal law says you can't do that while they're serving your country. <coughs> we'll cover that later this semester as well. Either this one or next. So, next semester. Any questions about the three burdens of proof? Preponderance of evidence, which is going to be 90% of the cases out of your book, and probably at least 90% of the cases that you handle. Clear and convincing evidence, which is between beyond a reasonable doubt and preponderance of evidence. And then beyond a reasonable doubt. If it's, if it's more than preponderance, will there need to be like a statute that dictates that or something? There will be a statute more than likely that says it has to be to this burden proof. Like defaults preponderance, but usually probably still it does default to preponderance. But if you can make the argument in court that it's a it is a constitutionally protected right that deserves more procedural safeguards, you may be able to argue the judge into using clear and convincing rather than preponderance. That's how Matthews versus Eldridge works. It's a tool for you to use to argue that judge, we've got something more at stake here than just simply money and argue the judge to use a higher burden of proof. Yes? If you're going to put them in order, clear and convincing would be the highest proof, is that right? No, clear and convincing is intermediate. Beyond a reasonable doubt is the highest burden of proof. Well, let's put it this way. How about beyond all doubt? That's even higher than beyond a reasonable doubt, right? That's not an actual burden of proof. But if you're going to convince somebody beyond all doubt that this is what happened, even a reasonable doubt wouldn't be enough. It doesn't matter how unusual the circumstances. You might argue, well, it could have been this. Well, if that's not a reasonable explanation, they're not supposed to consider it. That's beyond a reasonable doubt. What is reasonable under the circumstances? What an ordinary person would do in the same circumstances. Maybe what an ordinary person would do in those circumstances. How about this? I had a criminal case. One of my first jury trials I had a client that had a twin brother. And when we went to trial, the actual jury, there was somebody sitting in the potential jury that knew my client and knew his twin brother. And the only way you could tell the difference between the two was my client had a tattoo on his right arm, his twin brother had a tattoo on his left arm. And there was eyewitness testimony that they saw my client walking into a home to take stuff. My question was, are you sure it wasn't the twin? Now, would that be a reasonable doubt? I thought so, too, but they still convicted him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any questions about... Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. No. 
Over in criminal court, there's no statute for it. It's constitutional. But in civil? In civil, you're probably going to have a statute. But it's there for you to make the argument that it should be beyond a reasonable doubt, even in circumstances of clear and convincing, if you can convince the judge that the interest to be protected against an erroneous judgment need to have an additional safeguard. And the additional safeguard may be ask for the higher burden of proof to be beyond a reasonable doubt rather than clear and convincing evidence. Now, here's a practice pointer. In reality, what does it actually mean to a jury? Yeah. What is beyond a reasonable doubt? As, as compared to clear and convincing evidence, how do you instruct a jury what the difference on those two are? And do you think a jury of average seventh grade education is going to be able to understand that? Huh? So, while the U.S. Supreme Court has this lofty ideal about higher burdens of proof, in practice, are you going to be able to get a jury that understands that? Just something to keep in the back of your minds. Any other questions about last week? Oh, well, well, go ahead. Today, but I was just, you said I answered it, but how do you know or who determines which burden is being It depends on the type of case. As an example, child welfare cases clearly says it has to be clear and convincing evidence. So it's based on the type of case. And, it's, you know, and then if it's only money, there's no statute that says, you know, that it's preponderance. But there's a constitutional argument that that's all the protection you need against an erroneous judgment because it's just money. How many of y'all think it's just money when it comes time to pay tuition? Yeah. The Supreme Court doesn't protect that. Sorry. Does Alabama have certification in private law? Not that I've seen. I'm just wondering because on the West Coast, it's all Well, now you're talking about like a different bar exam. A bar exam to be admitted to practice before tribal courts. Right. That's not a certification for anybody that just takes and passes the Alabama bar. So we don't have anything like that here. We pass the Alabama bar and Well, when you pass the Alabama bar, you are licensed to practice in any state court in Alabama. And if you happen to have a child that comes before the court that's an Indian child or eligible to be an Indian child, then you need to know enough of the federal law to say, I think we need to call the tribe first. And then there was a crazy one I saw where the tribe said, yeah, if it's just visitation, we don't want to be consulted. And then they amended the pleading to uh, ask for custody, and they forgot to go back to the tribe and say, do you want to participate in this? And because they violated federal law, guess what? The judgment's no good. It's void. And why? Because they violated federal law. And if you violate the law in breaching a judgment, have you violated due process? That's last week, right? All right, any other questions about last week's stuff or what we covered this morning? Mention another issue involving three and proving your case regarding jurisdiction. And I was going over the notes and I had a question. If we were talking about personal jurisdiction, you needed three. We hadn't even gotten to that. Okay. So there's, there's three different things you have to have. Subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and due process for you to have a good judgment. This week, we're actually going to start talking about subject matter jurisdiction in federal courts. Next week, it's going to be subject matter jurisdictions in state courts. And then later, we're going to talk about personal jurisdiction. Your reading assignment for personal jurisdiction is going to be released next week so that you have a couple weeks to get the materials read before you are briefing them in class. Now, that's the scary part. Why did I give you two weeks to read the stuff? Because it's a lot. What I'm, what I'm trying to do is go through your book and find out which cases are actually in your book so you don't have to read, you don't have to print off the, the Westlaw version of it. You can read what's in the book because they kind of cut out the unnecessary stuff. 
So hopefully I'll have that done and ready for you by next week when we publish the assignment so you can read it. the abbreviated or the abridged versions of those cases if it's in your book. And then the ones that aren't in your book, you need to read the case. Tessie, another hand? Yes? The assumptions of modern American procedure. Why? I mean, I know it's touching on due process. Is that something that you were going to go over this week? Oh, due process is going to be gone over for two semesters. I just didn't know because you were touching a little bit on burden of proof and things that are skipped over and things that are assumed to be in the court system, and that's why I took, that's why you had us read that article in the booth. Well, you're going to see that, you're going to see that as we cover civil procedure over two semesters, you're going to see that they put in a requirement for jury trials. However, when you know that the system was designed to protect your right to a jury trial, you know why they put the rule in there about how to preserve your right to a jury trial. And some of that's going to be covered next week because when you have a trial that's by the judge alone and you have the right to a jury trial, some of the procedure is you got to actually demand your jury trial. And if you don't demand it, even though the law says that you have to demand it in order to preserve it, what's, the, what's that rule? If you fail to raise it, it's what? There you go. So when they tell you this is how you get a jury trial, if you fail to do that, it's waived. So we'll cover kind of each of those areas as we go through two semesters. That's kind of giving you a roadmap of the, the big picture of what civil procedure is designed to do. And then each week, we're going to probably hit a component or two of each of those. So as far as memorizing that, I don't think I've memorized those seven, but you need to know transubstantive, that it's supposed to cover every different type of case. That's rule one that says it applies to all cases except for the things listed in rule 81, which are just exceptions. Just know there are exceptions. Um, transactionalism you cover because it's the same transaction or occurrence. We'll get into that particularly heavy in second semester when we talk about res judicata collateral estoppel and claim estoppel. And the reason that you are estopped is because you only get one day in court, which is your transactionalism. So you see how it's kind of touches each of those areas. But no, I don't expect you to memorize those seven. Just know that that's the roadmap for two semesters. Any other questions for last week? Yes. I'm going to try to get all my questions. My first day back, I'm going to try to make up for last Saturday with all of my questions today. Can you uh, yeah. can you touch on the, the we had a, several of us had a lot of discussion this week about the depth of the weekly assignments? I can easily answer that for you. <laughs> Put enough there that you feel you need to have in order to study for the final. Yes, ma'am. No, it's assignment. You got to turn in on twin. Yeah, that's fine. You missed last week, right? You missed last week? Yes, sir. I came during the week, but I had work late, so I missed a little more about what to do. My friend was just like, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll yeah, what's on the syllabus? You have to turn it in every week by start of class for your next class. All right, any other questions? I had one person turn in like 18 pages. And I thought, what? No. I thought, ooh, that's overkill. <laughs> Was yours 18 pages? I think my 18 pages was from Thursday. That's the one I looked at. Oh. So it couldn't have been yours. Okay. Unless you're feeling guilty. <laughs> All right. A good yardstick for you is the material that we cover. Put enough in your notes that you can study for it and do well on the final exam. Combine all the things that we talked about as well as what's in your reading assignment. Put them into your in your writing assignment in a format that you can use to study. 
and that you think has enough in it that you'll do well on the exam. Actually, put enough in it that you think you can get an A on the exam. I want it to be complete. You know, don't skip essential stuff, like rules and exceptions to rules. I'd list those out, but then sometimes the court opinions just go on and on and on. Yes, sir. Good uh, question. Uh, we have a have you given out the reading assignment for next week that we have to turn in. I've given you the reading assignment for this week that you complete after after this class. Okay. It's on the twin site, <laughs> and it's after nine o'clock, so you ought to be able to see it. I set it to open at nine, so you don't read it before class. And there, and therefore, next week's assignment won't be visible to you until probably sometime around nine o'clock next week, so that you don't read it before class. Still not remember, remember, my idea in, in teaching this class is to go over the stuff first, so that you have an idea of what to, what you ought to pick up out of class. And then you go through it in class, and then you go through it after class with your notes, and those are forms of positive reinforcement where you're actually reinforcing what you heard in class and filling in a few of the missing details. Yes, ma'am. Um, is there? That's why I'm giving you week four and week five's assignment next week oh, okay. because it's going to take you probably two weeks to read all oh, that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Do you want the case that's just in a synopsis form? Or the cases out of your book okay. and the ones so I put on the reading assignment? The assignment? If you want to brief them, that's fine. If you need that, that much of it to study for your final exam, but if all you need to study for your final exam is just the rule of law out of it, Okay. That's fine too. So we're we're not necessarily going to brief about the contract. No. Okay. Except except for the class, except for the cases that we're going to brief in class, the ones that we're actually going to brief in class on weeks four and five, you need to have them like you did in contracts. Give enough of the facts that you know what the issue was and why the court ruled the way it did. All right. Any other questions? The cases that you gave to us, were we supposed to bring those and give them to us? The additional The ones that are on the reading assignment? Um, it's for his pull as much out of those cases as you need to study for the final exam. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it so hard <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? I mean, if I if I give you a case site that's got a bracket and says talks about due process, then I would probably concentrate about what the court said about due process rather than all the other issues they talk about. Right. That's just me, though. <laughs> yes. Uh, just letting you know, it's not posted to the point side yet. Yeah. It's not? No. Always third. Always third. You'll take care of it later, right? Yeah, if it's not out there yet, I'll go and check on it sometime after class and make sure that it's still supposed to be visible. All right, any other questions? Yeah, we're getting a delay starting on this week's material. and. I am legitimately trying to finish before noon today. <laughs> and I'll tell you that Thursday night we stayed, I didn't get out of here till after nine. So it's that much material. <laughs> Started at six. All right, any, any other questions? Okay. Mark. Mark. That's what we got covered this week. All right, let's start with Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution. So if you've got your rules books with you, and it has the U.S. Constitution in it, go ahead and flip over to Article 3. Section 1 says the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and 
in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. I think that sounds vaguely familiar like something I just quoted you last week. <laughs> How many of y'all are familiar with or organizational charters? What, what we are going to build this week is an organizational an organizational chart for the federal courts. Does that help everybody a roadmap where we're going? At the top of this organizational chart is the Supreme Court. Article 3, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution says there shall be a Supreme Court and such other inferior courts what do you think inferior means? Below. Below the Supreme Court, right? So on our org chart, we're going to say the Supreme Court at the top and inferior below the Supreme Court, there are going to be additional courts. Now, hypothetically, could Congress pass a law that says, well, during their deliberations, they say, you know, the Supreme Court is so politically charged and they don't really make a whole lot of help. The courts of appeals make good decisions and they can they can be the final deciders of cases. So Congress passes a law that says there's no more Supreme Court final decisions are now going to be made by the circuit courts of appeals. Could Congress pass a law that says that? Yes. I have a definitive yes. Change constitution. All right, how many of you agree with our definitive yes that Congress can pass that law? What's the law? I've got one per two people that agree with you. Can Congress pass a law that says we're not going to have a Supreme Court anymore? No, no. They can pass a law. Yeah, it had to be a constitution. They can pass it, probably. They Ah, they can pass it probably, but it wouldn't yes. stick. <laughs> That's right. That is absolutely correct. It would be an unconstitutional law because it clearly contradicts the U.S. Supreme Court, con the U.S. Constitution. But can Congress pass laws that violate the Constitution? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes. They do it every the year. <laughs> it happens. We're talking about federal courts this week. The next week I'm going to ask you the same question, and it happens every year down in Montgomery. It violates the Alabama Constitution and the U.S. Constitution in some cases. So can Congress pass a law like that? Yes. The U.S. Constitution, Article 3, Section 1 says, there shall be a Supreme Court. So if Congress passes a law that says we're getting, we're doing away with the Supreme Court, can they pass the law? Yes. Is it unconstitutional? Yes. Well, here's the question. Does it clearly contradict a term of the Constitution? Yes. Yes, it does. Part of your job as an attorney when you get out and start practicing is you're going to have to defend the Constitution of the United States. That's part of your oath. And so if Congress passes a stupid law that says we're not having, I mean an unconstitutional law, <laughs> that says we're doing away with the Supreme Court, then it's your duty, your sworn duty, to defend the U.S. Constitution and challenge the fact that that's an unconstitutional law. Everybody with me? Now, other than that, Congress is going to be given certain powers to pass laws, but those powers are going to be restricted by what? We talked about this last week. By the Constitution, right? They can pass whatever laws they want, and as long as they're constitutional, they're probably going to be okay for civil procedure purposes. When you get into comp law and study some of the exceptions, we'll let them cover that. But suffice it to say that as long as it doesn't clearly contradict a term in the Constitution, then that law is probably going to be sufficiently constitutional to survive at least the facial challenge. All right, so Article 3, Section 1 says... There shall be a Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time ordain and establish. So what does it tell you? 
yes, we're going to have a Supreme Court, and then Congress is going to create other <coughs> courts in the federal system. And if they create the court, what do they have to do? What does Congress have to do if they create the court itself? They have to have judges. They have to fund it. Well, they have to fund it as well. They have to establish what it's for. Now, getting back to the org chart part of this drawing, what else do they have to establish? How many of y'all are in, have served in the military? What do they have to establish? Chain of command. Chain of command. So they're going to have to actually pass statutes which says the order in which this charge is organized is the way the courts are going to be organized. So they have to tell you what the court is, they have to create the court, tell you what the court is, tell you the, the jurisdiction, the boundaries of the court, then they have to tell you what kind of cases that they hear. By the way, what kind of cases they hear? Subject matter jurisdiction. Whether or not the court has the authority to hear and decide the case. So we're getting subject matter jurisdiction built in, but then not only do you build the org chart, but you also have to establish time, time limits on when you can go from one court to the next. By the way, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that those time limits are jurisdictional. If you miss your deadline, the court doesn't have the jurisdiction to hear your case. So not only do we establish what the actual court system looks like on our org chart, we also establish what kinds of cases they hear. We establish the time deadlines for you to have your case heard by a higher court. Congress has to do all of that when they actually go and create a court system. One of my favorite quotes out of a case says, federal courts have a virtually unflagging obligation to exercise the jurisdiction given them. And yet federal courts are limited, courts of limited jurisdiction and a presumption, and there is a presumption against the exercise of federal jurisdiction. So the federal courts have a bouncer at the front door, a figurative bouncer, that says, we don't want to hear your case. You've got to convince us that we have the authority to hear your case. And in fact, as attorneys, what you're going to tell the court is, you have a duty to hear it because I have the authority to file my claim here. So bouncer number one is subject matter jurisdiction that keeps you out of federal court. There's a presumption to keep you out until you actually convince the court that you have the right to be there. Now, getting back to our our design considerations. Remember, we there are number four, I think, in there is a jurisdictional averment. You have to have a jurisdictional averment to tell the court you have the authority to hear this case. That's built into federal civil procedure. One of the things you have to do is tell the court under what authority they have to hear and decide this case. And if you don't tell them what authority that they have to hear or decide it, guess what? The presumption is against it, they'll throw your case out. <laughs> Jurisdictional averment. A-V-E-R-M-E-N-T. Y'all know what averments are? They're statements. But they're a little stronger than statements. They're like pronouncements. I hear pronounced that this court has to hear this case pursuant to this statute. And in our chart, we're going to actually give you the statutes that you use along the way to convince the court that they have to hear the case. Because if you don't tell the court what jurisdiction they have, there's a presumption against it. Everybody follow that? Now, each and every one of you ought to already have this feeling about federal courts just simply from that those two statements. They're courts of limited jurisdiction, a presumption against it, but they have a virtually unflagging obligation to hear the cases to which they've been given jurisdiction. So what do you think the primary duty of federal court is? Number one, keep you out of federal court. Okay. Remember that presumption against jurisdiction? That, that's number one hurdle, keep you out of federal court. Now, if you get if you don't have the right to file in federal court, where can you file? State court. In fact, the funny thing about federal and state courts is that they are they are from two different sovereignties. 
One of them is the sovereignty of the United States. The other one is the sovereignty of the state of Alabama. Each government has the right to tell people what kind of cases that they're going to settle disputes for and how you're going to settle your disputes. <coughs> so Alabama's created a court system, which, by the way, incredibly looks like the federal system, but with a whole lot of key differences. And then the federal court system is created that's going to hear only certain types of cases. They do not hear every type of case. And if you don't have the right to go to federal court, you always have the right to go to state. In fact, generally speaking, the plaintiff gets to pick whether or not they want to go to federal court or state court. And there's case law out there from the U.S. Supreme Court saying that they are courts of concurrent jurisdiction. State courts have the right to hear federal claims. Federal courts have the right to hear state claims. And state courts, of course, have the right to hear state claims, right? Federal courts, of course, have the right to hear federal claims. We're getting to that later today on our org chart. Any question about, you get to pick and choose your court. It's not like picking and choosing your judge. That's called forum shopping. But you do get, you get, you do get to pick your, your court. What you're describing here, is that an extension? No, ma'am. The abstention doctrine is when they decide they don't want to hear your case, even though they have the authority to hear it. And there's several of those abstention doctrines, and I've got them listed for you on your reading assignment. Have y'all found it yet? Um, your abstention doctrines are Pullman. <coughs> and the court, in this case, says there's four basic types of abstention, but I found five. There's actually a sixth one. So your four types are Pullman abstention, Burford abstention. How many of y'all know what abstention means? Have y'all ever heard the word abstain? Okay. Voting's a good example of that, but I was thinking something else. What happens when you abstain from something? Just don't do it. <laughs> How many of y'all heard abstention is the best form of birth from birth? <laughs> best way to prevent pregnancies is abstention, right? <laughs> it's the same word, abstention. All right, so there's Pullman. And the plaintiff alleged constitutional violation and pendant state claims. We'll cover that shortly. Pullman, U-L-L-M-A-N. And the court ruled that the federal case should be stayed so the parties could get a definitive ruling from state court on a state law issue. Well, you're going to see here shortly that the federal court could have just asked the state court what the law is, and the state court would have answered it. But instead, they decided, well, we just don't want to hear the case. Um, Burford, <clears throat> the court ruled that the case should be dismissed in federal court so it could be taken up in state court for the state court to decide a state law issue. By the way, these are on your reading assignment. So if you're not following real quickly, that's fine. Younger abstention, I skipped one, but Younger was a criminal case. And Younger decided he didn't want to be prosecuted in state court for a criminal charge. So he filed a federal court lawsuit to order the state court prosecution to stop. That's using the two different court systems. And in Younger, they said, no, because both courts have the authority to hear whether or not something is federally unconstitutional, then you need to raise your federal unconstitutional issue in state court and fight it there rather than to get one court ordering that another court should hear a case. Um, Colorado River is number four of the big four. Um, the doctrine was invoked when there was parallel state cases in proceedings. What do y'all think parallel means? Side by side. There was a case in federal court and there was a case in state court. And they were the same parties and the same issue. You want to know what the federal court decided? I didn't want to hear they wanted to conserve scarce judicial resources into clear dockets. It 
rests its consideration on a wise judicial administration. So what do you think they did? They dismissed the federal court case because there was already a state court case going. In order to preserve their judicial resources. This is although they had the right to be in court. So, yeah, the federal courts have a virtually unflagging obligation to hear the cases to which it has jurisdiction, unless they just don't want to. That's kind of the exception, and there's your abstention doctrines. Rooker Feldman. Um, it's a combination of two cases, Rooker and Feldman, and what happened is they got a state court judgment, and the loser of the state court judgment filed in federal court to have the state court judgment declared to be void, so they couldn't enforce it. They said, yeah, if you didn't think it was legit, you should have appealed it, rather than to come to federal court and try to sue to stop it from being enforced. Now, the other abstention doctrine that I ran across is that federal courts don't want to hear domestic relations cases. So, in here, you're not going to find domestic relations cases. Except maybe in the Supreme Court, as the final decision maker on federal issues. So if something is unconstitutional, that's a kind of a family law case or a domestic relations case, it can make its way all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'll give you an example. How many of y'all have heard of uh, ex part or Troxel v. Granville? Troxel v. Granville, a case out of Washington State, where this one person decided, I want to see this kid. I want to have a visitation. And the court said, okay. He had no rights to it, and the parents weren't injuring the child, and the parents weren't unfit, but the court went ahead and gave that person a visitation. Well, according to the Supreme Court, it doesn't matter who that person is. The parent has, has the fundamental right to raise their kids and decide who they're going to be around. And so, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court to say parents have a constitutional fundamental right to decide with whom their kids are going to associate. So really, it didn't make a difference who it was. That's why I give it to you like that. This person just wants to see this kid. Yeah, the facts are a little bit more, but the Supreme Court said it doesn't really matter. Yes? In that case, did the parents object to this yes. person? Yes. Yeah. And they still went ahead? Uh-huh. And the parents took it all the way up, and the U.S. Supreme Court said, yeah, parents, you do have a fundamental right, and unless you can show the parents to be unfit or, or harmful to the child, we have to abide by parents' wishes. Does that sound like maybe a more fundamental right was, was being protected other than just money? As it turns out, it's a higher burden of proof. <coughs> all right. The rest of Article 3, Section 1 says, The judges, both of the Supreme Court and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during the continuance in office. So how long does a federal judge stay a federal judge? Until they retire or die. Until they retire or die. It is a lifetime appointment. Now, funny, but Alabama used to have appointed judges back before Alabama became a state. Alabama was a territory. They had appointed judges. The judges were appointed for a lifetime. The way that came to a head was that there was a lawsuit brought on a breach of contract, and it was the interest rate that they were challenging because it was kind of a high interest rate. And the Alabama Supreme Court decided since it was the law at the time that the contract was entered into, which was coincidentally before Alabama became a state, that it was binding and therefore they had to pay that interest rate. Well, it irritated somebody who happened to be a lawmaker. And they actually were involved in the Constitutional Convention. And they changed where Alabama's appointed judges actually had to be now elected. And that judge promptly lost the election. 
So ever since, Alabama now has had elected judges. But back to the U.S. Supreme Court. The judges are actually lifetime judges. Now this is Article Three of the Constitution. So it's any Article Three judge has a lifetime appointment. There are other courts that are established in the federal system, such as bankruptcy court. Bankruptcy court's actually established under Article One of the Constitution, dealing with bankruptcies. Those judges don't have lifetime appointments. Only Article Three judges do. They're appointed for a number of years. It's either six or eight. They are federal judges, though. They are federal judges, but they're Article One judges. Article Three judges are the ones that have their jobs for lifetime. Now you know how judges get appointed, right? President. The president picks out a few people that he thinks can withstand the Senate's barrage of questions. Did, did y'all see the confirmation process for? Oh no, I was going back to uh, Clarence Thomas. Oh yeah. Did y'all see that for Clarence Thomas? I do. That was brutal. And yet he survived that, and he's one of the justices on the Supreme Court. And yeah, Kavanaugh and, and the other one that's more recent. Gorsuch. Gorsuch. Yeah, those are all brutal. And they start digging up bones in your past. <clears throat> so anybody that wants to volunteer to go through that, <laughs> whoever the judge nominates and the person says, yeah, I'll go through it, then they get sent over to the Senate for confirmation. Once the Senate confirms them, and they say, okay, you are a judge now, then that person is a judge for life. All right, Section 2 of Article 3 says the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity. All right, let's stop just at that portion of it and say, remember last week we talked about the merger of law and equity? That now we have rules of civil procedure that covers every case regardless of if it's an action in law or a case in equity. It's rule two, right? Merger of law and equity. So the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law or equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. So constitutional laws and treaties of the United States um, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming land grants from different states, and between a state and citizens thereof, and foreign state citizens or subjects. <laughs> but it's not everybody. This is, remember we talked about the Constitution being a contract between the people and the government. These are the types of cases that the people have agreed that the federal courts can make decisions on. And then it says, <clears throat> In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and those to which a state shall be a party, the, sh the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Here's our next term that we need to learn. Original jurisdiction. Anybody want to take a stab at what original jurisdiction is? The court has the first dead level. First dead. That's a good that's a good legal term. <laughs> First dibs. That's it. That's one of the constitutions. Yeah, the Constitution says we have first dibs. <laughs> I can't wait to use that argument in court. <laughs> I've copyrighted that, so you're only good. Okay. Would this apply to sovereign citizens, Article 3, where they're in the United States? Ah, uh, sovereign citizens aren't listed in that list, are they? Well, it says all. Sovereign citizens don't believe in the U.S. Constitution. Well, I, I understand that, but it says that under the jurisdiction, 
that. If y'all haven't had a chance to watch a sovereign citizen go to court and argue something, yeah. I encourage you to do that. They do all the following on the judge, on the prosecutor, on just about everybody in the courthouse. They are truly entertaining. And they show up in all courts, including night court. They're charged with traffic violations. I don't recognize the authority of this court. Oh, yeah, there's the people who claim they don't have to show driver's license right. or states. Yeah. Yeah. So, sovereign citizens are not in this list. Okay. And that's part of the argument that they make. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Original jurisdiction. First is, I like that. <laughs> Original jurisdiction would mean where a case originates. Original jurisdiction, where a case originates. And where a case originates, what do you think they do with that case? They hear it. They're the actual trial court. So courts of original jurisdiction are the trial court. I'm sorry, are you a sovereign citizen? <laughs> 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 no, you didn't get my email. Was it this morning? <laughs> no, but I'll, I'll double check. I don't usually work after five on Friday. <laughs> Just in case if any of y'all try to call me. Um, a case where a, a court, the court where a case originates, which is going to be the first filing, it's going to be the trial court, and technically, yes, it's the court with first dibs. Yes. Can that, uh, let's say that case originates in federal court and somebody wants to be heard in state court, can they move it? Can the, can the court give up that jurisdiction? Well, is it the plaintiff who filed it in federal court? Sure. And the plaintiff now wants to move it to state court? Why did they pick federal court? Because they're Alabama. Uh, hold on, we're not going to berate Alabama or Auburn. Georgia Tech's okay, but not Alabama and Auburn. If you're on a, say you're on the arsenal, you get the DUI file on the arsenal. That's a federal crime. Federal crime. It cannot be moved no ma'am it is a federal crime the federal court has jurisdiction over that offense even if the defendant is saying i have a motion to move to madison county no no i think anything in the military base that's right yeah it's federal. that's right it's a federal case that's right. so remember the two governments i talked about well the government has the authority to prosecute you for federal crimes alabama has the right to prosecute you for state crimes and according to the u.s supreme court last term it doesn't matter if it's the exact same offense both governments have the right to prosecute you for it and it doesn't violate double jeopardy would the defendant because be, they're separate governments would the defendant then be able to move from madison county and say i'd like my DUI to be heard in federal court ah the problem is if it occurred in madison county it has to be heard in madison county. the venue would be Yes. Now, if we're going through section two, subsection one, two, three, wouldn't it just be easier to tell us what the power shouldn't extend to rather um, than what it does? Well, here's the thing. If we cover it in class, you will have heard it before you go in the bar exam. No, but I'm just saying as a way to remember outside of the bar, outside of everything, what it doesn't, i.e. sovereign citizens, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. No. We study what the actual Constitution says. It's easier that way. Right. Um, the, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction in cases where it's ministers, consuls, and ambassadors. What's the Constitution actually saying at this point? The U.S. Supreme Court can be the trial court. It has original jurisdiction. But does it say that other courts don't have original jurisdiction doesn't say that, does it? It only says that the Supreme Court has the original jurisdiction, but it doesn't say the U.S. District Court doesn't. But the way the Supreme Court wanted to take the case, they would have. If they want to take it, they can take it. Now, as a general rule, the Supreme Court doesn't want to hear anything. They pick and choose what they want to hear. Yes. You commit a crime overseas, you go to your embassy, and you're sent back to the states. Um, is it, it's federal court that would hear that case, is that correct? Uh, if you commit a crime in a foreign country, it's going to be the foreign country's court. You can say that's 
state protection Federal courts can. The U.S. courts can here in a different country? The U.S. courts have no authority in four countries. The United States does. I knew that. No reason. I wasn't the impression that the U.S. says it's going to travel overseas. Well, they can. And part of that is if they plan it in the United States and then go overseas to do it, then they have jurisdiction because it was planned here. But if you get a DUI in Italy, you're going to have to have really good shape. When I'm reading this, it says to all cases affecting ambassadors and other public ministers and consuls. So I think a U.S. ambassador to other, you know, in, in other nations, that's not that. Well, technically, the, the uh, ambassador is actually on the premises of property which is considered to be U.S. property. Okay, so a crime committed at the embassy. Crime committed at the embassy is yes, U.S. property. Okay. But if it's outside the embassy, it's not U.S. property, it's foreign soil. Okay. But if he committed outside the embassy, he's subject to the He is. He or she. All right, so original jurisdiction means where the case can originate. Now the next one, in all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction. <coughs> all right, what does that mean? It can be appealed to them. It can be appealed to them. Now, it doesn't mean you get your trial in there. It means they hear your appeal. Now, is an appeal a trial? No. no. They're usually going to be just reviewing a record to make sure that you got a fair trial. Um, they have appellate jurisdiction as to both law and fact with exceptions and under such regulations as Congress shall make. So that's giving pretty broad authority to the court system. Now, let's get to the actual statutes. Remember the Constitution gives Congress the authority to pass laws. So there's the limits on what Congress can pass, which would be constitutional. Now we get to the actual statutes, which say these are the actual cases courts here. Bless you. Um, 28 USC and all of these code sections I give you tonight or, or today are going to be 28 USC. Section 1. The Supreme Court of the United States shall consist of a Chief Justice of the United States and eight Associate Justices, any six of whom shall constitute a quorum. Any six of whom shall constitute a quorum. How many of y'all know the term quorum? It's a business term, right? It's the number of people you have to have present in order to do business. They have a problem with that? Yes, with the federal form on the uh, voting uh, regulations uh, campaign finance. There's not enough people to have a form on the federal Where? Which court? Um, on the federal level. We're talking federal. Here down. So, where? Which court? As it, as it turns out, there's going to be district courts, and district courts have quorums. Then there's going to be a level of circuit courts above district and still below the U.S. Supreme Court, which have to have quorums, and then the Supreme Court has to have a quorum. So can Congress pass a law that says we're only going to have three justices on the Supreme Court? How is it unconstitutional? Section 1 is a code section. So can Congress, Congress can pass a law that says we're only going to have three justices on the Supreme Court. Yeah, because the Constitution doesn't, does it the the Constitution doesn't protect the numbers. Was it FDR? Somebody tried to add. Oh, they're, they're, they're trying to add. They're trying to add more. They're trying to add more federal courts. No, they were trying to do 
They're trying to add more of the Supreme Court. The answer is yes, they can change the number of Supreme Court justices to three because 28 U.S.C. Section 1 says that there shall be eight associates and one chief. And they can simply change that to say one chief and two associates. The problem is the Constitution says that all the judges that are currently there hold their office for lifetime and you can't cut their pay. So what do you do with all the extras that we have who have office for life? Make them senior judges. When they die, can they just absorb that seat? They can eliminate the spot as each of them die. And that would be constitutional because the Constitution doesn't protect the number of judges. It only protects the existence of court. All right, 28 U.S.C. Section 2. The term of the court. Court shall hold at seat of government. Supreme Court shall hold at the seat of government. Now, what does that mean? Where the government is located in D.C. in this case. Where the government is located, which is D.C. They shall hold at the seat of government. So they have to be in Washington, D.C. And then it also says, a term of court commencing on the first Monday in October of each year and may hold such adjourned or special terms as may be necessary. So when does the Supreme Court's actual term begin each year? First Monday in October. Now those of y'all who are old enough to remember Walter Matthau? Y'all know who Walter Matthau is? Yes. Huh? Yeah, grumpy old man. Did you know that there was a movie made it's called First Monday in October? It was made, I think it was back in the 70s, where they were making a movie about the first female justice on the Supreme Court. This was back in the 70s. And yes, it was a comedy because Walter Matthau was involved in this. So if you find spare time and need some entertainment, besides paper chase, you can watch First Monday in October. <laughs> the precedence of associate justices Precedents. What are they talking about, really? Rank. Who's the highest ranking associate justice on the Supreme Court? They're calling it precedents of the Supreme Court. Now, why does that even matter? In case the Chief Justice is out. In case the Chief Justice is out, the first one rank wise would be the one responsible for handling the administrative matters. But when Rank was died before Roberts was appointed. Justice. There was an acting chief justice who was the most senior of the associate justices. And now, that's, who's, that's who settled the court the longest after the chief justice, is that correct? Well, by statute, by statute it says they shall have precedence according to the seniority of their commissions, which is a fancy word for saying whoever was first appointed is the one who has priority over the next appointed person. So it establishes a clear chain of command in the Supreme Court for each of the associate justices. <laughs> now, as a piece of trivia, there are nine benches and there are nine seats at the front bench of the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice sits in the middle. Where do you think the next highest justice sits? To the left, right. to, the left or to the right? Yeah. I think it's to his right. And then the next highest ranking after that sits to the Chief Justice's left. And then the next one after that sits to the right in the second seat over. And then the left, the second seat over. And then the right, the third seat. And then the left, the third seat. And then the right, the fourth seat. And the left, the fourth seat. That's how they actually sit. So they have assigned seats. And that's for the perception of power. Yes. So who appoints the chief justice? They have like Well, the president names the chief justice, and then the Senate confirms the chief justice. Remember the Senate confirmation? So in Alabama, is that, is that the same one? Because I know that Alabama, we elect a chief justice. Oh. We'll cover that next week. Right.
All right, now as far as the justice, what about the justices who to, whose commissions bear the same date? What if two of them were appointed on the same day, or three of them were appointed on the same day? Yeah, two of, who, whoever was, was first that day that got approved yeah. by the Senate. Yeah. Because yeah. technically they're, in, they're ahead of... Actually, their age. that's their age. Okay. By statute it says their age. If they're appointed on the same day, or commissioned on the same day, then they go by their age. <laughs> this is section four, if anybody's following along. All right. Our next code section is section 1251. The Supreme Court shall have original and exclusive jurisdiction of all controversies between two or more states. Well, now we're adding another term. Original, which means court of origin or first gives. Right? But what is exclusive thrown on there? What does that mean? Only. Yes, yeah, the only court that can hear it. So 1251, Section A says the Supreme Court shall have original and exclusive jurisdiction of all controversies between two states. One state can sue another state, but the only place that they can do it is in the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, y'all might be wondering why states might sue each other. Yeah. Yeah, most of it's water cases. Supreme Court, or, uh, yeah, the Chattahoochee between Alabama and Georgia. That's a big lawsuit. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, between Washington and Oregon, since Oregon just lost a game last week. Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> the, the Columbia River, which separates those two states, was actually the subject of litigation in the U.S. Supreme Court because they were fighting over who owned the water. What about this, the Mississippi River? That's so what that involves several states. It does, and I haven't researched the Mississippi River, but I did research the Chattahoochee. And as it turns out, Alabama and Georgia were suing over who had rights to the Chattahoochee River. Alabama wanted water rights, and Georgia said, no, the, the river belongs to us. Um, they can't say it's U.S. waters? Okay. Well, here's the thing. If you read the U.S. Supreme Court opinion on it, it says that Georgia was actually created by a, by a <coughs> proclamation in England to be a prison state. <laughs> John Oglethorpe. It was created to be a prison state, and its boundaries went from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. That's its original forming was over in England as, as a prison state. Now, when it started to grow, and this was around 1815, um, they decided it was too big of a territory, and the state of Georgia actually gave back to the United States government some land, which, which actually was created to be the Mississippi Territory, which was all the land from the west bank of the Chattahoochee River to the Mississippi River. That was a deed that they actually gave to the U.S. government. So the state of Georgia owned it, and they gave a deed to the U.S. government that said everything from the west bank of the Chattahoochee to the Mississippi. And then back in 1817, Mississippi got enough votes to become a state in 17 or 18. And then 1819, Alabama got enough votes to become a state. And so the Mississippi Territory was Alabama and Mississippi. And then Mississippi became a state, leaving the Alabama Territory, which was the territorial courts. I told you that, that interest rate case. And then in 1819, Alabama became a state. And then Alabama sued Georgia to say that water belongs to us. And the U.S. Supreme Court went back and examined the deeds, and the deed from Georgia to the federal government gave them only the property, not the water, from the west bank of the Chattahoochee to the Mississippi. And the Supreme Court said, 
had Georgia given like the middle of the river over to the middle of the Mississippi, then Alabama would have had some argument that it owned the middle of the river. But since they used the west coast of, or the west bank of the Chattahoochee River, it necessarily meant that they kept all the water. And so the Chattahoochee belongs to Georgia. And believe it or not, that's an actual U.S. Supreme Court case that was tried in the Supreme Court because they are the court of original and exclusive jurisdiction. And then there was another fight over the Potomac. I think that was Maryland and Virginia fighting over who owned who owned how much property. All right, so 1251A. I'm going to put a note up here that says OP two states. Original exclusive where it's two states. What that tells you is this is the trial court. There's no other court can hear this in this case, it's trial court. So if after law school you graduate, pass the bar, and become employed by the state of Alabama and decide you want to sue Georgia again, you draft up a complaint against the state of Georgia on behalf of the state of Alabama, and you have to actually file that in the U.S. Supreme Court because it's the only court that can hear the case. 1251B says the Supreme Court shall have original but not exclusive jurisdiction of, and then number one is, all actions or proceedings to which ambassadors, other public ministers, consuls, or vice consuls of foreign states are parties original but not exclusive. So what do you think the Supreme Court does in those cases? Send it down. Send it down. We don't want to hear it. We don't have to hear it. Um, B2, controversies between the United States and a state. So let's say the U.S. government is suing the state of Alabama for prison overcrowding. Which, by the way, they are. And by the way, Alabama is paying sanctions for having overcrowded prisons. Well, they're ordering us to take <coughs> sanctions until we actually improve the conditions because technically it's unconstitutional. It violates the Eighth Amendment. Mm -hmm. Cruel and unusual prisoners? punishment. Huh? Are the sanctions paid to the prisoners? No, ma'am. Mm -hmm. really? It's paid over the federal court. All right. Number three, all actions or proceedings by a state against citizens of another state or against aliens. Original but not exclusive. Original, comma, not exclusive is section B. Now let's start drawing in some other courts. got one level of boxes down below the Supreme Court, which is going to be the circuit court level. We'll come back in and fill in the details on that. Below that row of boxes at the circuit court level, I've got a box on either side, one of which is going to be the district court, which is the trial court, usually in federal courts. And on the right-hand side, I've got a three-judge panel box at the district court level. 1253. 
28 U.S.C. section 1253 says that except as otherwise provided by law, any party may appeal to the Supreme Court from an order granting or denying after notice and a hearing. Well, there's that due process sneaking back in, right? Notice and a hearing. <laughs> An interlocutory or permanent injunction in any civil action, suit, or proceeding required by any act of Congress to be heard and determined by a district court of three judges. So I've got a question. I've got it marked down as a three judge panel. This is a district court court with three district court judges hearing a case. Now, how many judges do you think you normally get in a case? One. One, but Congress has passed special laws that says on these types of disputes, we think it's an important procedural protection enough that we have three different judges decide the case, and it's going to be a majority of the three. Hopefully, they'll be pushing. Everybody's allergic to federal court. <laughs> important enough that they're going to put three judges to make the decision. And it only takes two of them to be a majority of three, right? So not only do you have a three-judge panel making a decision, but you have the right to appeal. And I'm going to put appeal up here. You have the right to appeal the decision of a three-judge panel. Any party to that case can appeal that three-judge panel's decision to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, if you have a right to appeal, does the Supreme Court have a duty to hear it? Yes. They absolutely have to hear that. It's an appeal from a three-judge panel. They have a duty to hear it. They can't get out of it. Just like an action between two states. They have a duty to hear it. Everybody with me? Now, what you're thinking about is their discretionary cases where they decide whether they hear it or not. But there are some cases that they have to hear. Most of the cases, they don't have to hear. But these are the ones they do. Actions between cases, two states, it is original exclusive jurisdiction. They have to try the case. Appeals for three judge panels are appeals that they have to hear. So they'll try to hear a uh, dissonance that they don't have to hear. No, they don't have to hear it. Only if, they can, only if the lawyers can convince the court to hear it, they'll hear it. But they don't have a duty to hear it, even death penalty cases. You said on their original exclusive, they have to hear that one. They have to hear original exclusive between two states. And then they have to hear the appeals under 1253, which is a three judge panel. There's no appeal. In fact, here's another thing you need to know about the, the court systems, the two court systems. In the federal court system, the United States Supreme Court has the final word on what federal law is. In fact, there's an old, there's an old case in your com law book that you'll study right at the beginning of com law. It's Marbury versus Madison. It is the case where the Supreme Court said, we are the court who decides final issues of federal law. We tell you what the law is. Now, if they're the ones who decide what the final issue is on federal law, who do you think decides the final issue on state law? State Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Alabama Supreme Court, where it's the highest court of each state. The highest court of each state decides final issues of state law, but final issues of federal law is decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. And we're coming up on, on how state court decisions can be reviewed in a minute. We're, we're still building our chain of command diagram. So, three judge panel decisions. I have found one example where Congress has created a statute that says these types of cases have to be heard by a three judge panel. I think there's more, but at least I know this one is one that's an absolute three judges have to hear it, and that is federal redistricting cases. Do you know when those cases usually come up? 
right after the census. Because as soon as they find out how many people live and where they live, they start to be drawing lines. And they want to draw those lines so that they create majorities in those certain districts. And when they do that, what does it end up doing to the people who are minorities in those districts? Disenfranchising. It disenfranchises them. It strips away their rights to vote. Effectively, because of the majority block created in those districts. The term for that's called gerrymandering. Just so you know. That's the types of cases that are important enough. They give three judges to it. And then the U.S. Supreme Court wants to hear those cases because they need to decide, and they need to decide pretty quick, on whether or not those districts have been gerrymandered. Now, the rest of these appeal times, how long do you think it takes to appeal from a district court to the circuit? Not the deadline, but how long do you think it takes for for a decision reached in state court to reach a final decision in circuit court? It can take years, right? And then after the after the circuit court hears it, if they want to apply to the Supreme Court, it can take a while before the Supreme Court decides that they want to hear the case, and then the Supreme Court decides the case on their own time. Now. Does gerrymandering sound like one of those cases that can be put off for years like that? No, because Congress is elected every two years. They got to hear those cases fast. Yes. That's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if, if that would be a case that would speed that, but you. you know. Yeah, they want to hear those cases faster and decide the issues pretty quick. They have priority. All right. So besides the three judge panel under 1253, and I'm drawing that with a solid line. Hmm because they have the right to appeal. So I'm mixing in a few different types of legends, I guess, different different systems that I need a legend for. But the, the solid lines are going to be you have the right. Dash lines are is discretionary. And 1254 is one of those discretionaries. Cases in the courts of appeals may be reviewed by the Supreme Court by the following method. Number one, a writ of certiorari, C-E-R-T-I-O-R-A-R-I, C-E-R-T, period, or C-E-R-T-I-O-R-A-R-I. -R -R now, how many of y'all run across that term, cert denied, cert granted? Every one of you. That's what they're talking about here is certiorari and... I'm going to draw little lines from my boxes on the circuit court level. And that's 1254. Certiorari. Now, what do you think certiorari is? It's reviewed by a higher court. It is, request. it is a request to be reviewed by a higher court. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is it something the court has to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have to. Order. Orders that delivered. If the court above orders the record from below to be delivered to that court, the inferior court has to respond to that. But does the superior court on there have to hear your case? The answer is no, they don't have to hear your case. Can you repeat that if the... If the lower court receives an order from the superior court directing them to send the record, then they have to do that. That's what a certiorari technically is. It's an order to deliver the record. And that's for the superior court to review and make sure that the inferior court has not done something which it doesn't agree with, which the Superior Court does not agree with. Does everybody follow that? That's under 1254. It's called certiorari. 1254-1 is by writ of certiorari. And then number two, Number 
two is a certified question. It says, by certification at any time by a court of appeals of any question of law in a civil or criminal case to which instructions are desired, and upon such certification, the Supreme Court may give binding instructions and require the entire record to be sent up for decision on the entirety, entirety of the matter of controversy. So here's the way it works with certification. If any of these courts of civil, cert, any of these circuit courts of appeals, circuit courts of appeals, don't know a final decision on, on some question of federal law, they can say, Supreme Court, we don't know the law on this. Would you please give us directions? And if the Supreme Court agrees to do that, they'll give them instructions on what to follow. Now, how many of you know any federal judge that says, I don't know what the law is? <laughs> ah, more than likely, they're just going to decide it anyway. And what happens is, each of these circuits decides it differently. And so what have they done? No, because that's an advisory opinion. Okay. Good question. Um, say that you do the certified question to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court comes back and answers that question. Does that deny the appeal if it, to the person who might be on the bad news receiving end of that, of that decision? Well, they don't have the right to appeal from the circuit court. They only have the right to petition, petition for discretionary review, which is certiorari. But that would be more likely to be denied their uh, writ of certiorari based on, based on that, correct? Yeah, depending on how the judge, how the court rules, yes. So <clears throat> I'll tell you that there's certification of questions in the state courts as well. Alabama's got something similar that says the Alabama Supreme Court can receive certified questions from federal courts. And it doesn't say it has to be from the Supreme Court. It can be from any federal court, district court, circuit court, or Supreme Court, where they can certify a question to the Alabama Supreme Court that says, what is the final answer of Alabama law on this issue? And Alabama can issue that, answer the question back to whatever federal court it is, and then the federal court can use that in whatever decision that they have pending before them. Now, that's more likely to happen because they may or may not know what state law is. But don't be surprised if you see the federal court judges say, we think this is what Alabama would say their law is. And then they rationalize what they think Alabama would say their law is. And they make that decision. That happens too. Just like they will venture out and say what they think the federal law is. Now, the problem when you have all the different circuits deciding federal questions and they reach different conclusions, now you've created something called a split between the circuits. That's one of the grounds for the U.S. Supreme Court to hear your appeal. Actually, not appeal, your certiorari. Discretionary? You tell the U.S. Supreme Court that there's a split amongst the circuits. Some of the circuits are deciding it this way, others are deciding it this way, and therefore we need one final answer which clarifies it nationwide and then if the Supreme Court decides to hear that case, then they'll clear up and overrule whatever circuits decided it the wrong way. <coughs> Everybody with me? So certified question or certiorari, either one of those is discretionary with the Supreme Court. Now we get to the other one. I'm going to use a different color marker. In this case, it's going to be a black marker. We're going to draw a box around what I've labeled as being the state's highest court. And I'm going to draw a dashed line over to the Supreme Court. So dashed, I'm giving you a hint as to what. The, as to what. Discretionary. It's discretionary. Guess what it is? It's section 1257. And it is a certiorari.
and the certiorari is a discretionary review from a state's highest court for the U.S. Supreme Court to review the state's highest court's decision. Everybody following me? Now here's where it gets tricky. Who has the final word on what state law is? The state Supreme Court. So can you petition for certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court on a final issue of state law? Yes. No. With state law, the final word is state Supreme Court. But if it's only federal issues get to go up certiorari from state's highest court. And why is it only federal issues? Because the U.S. Supreme Court is the final word on federal issues. The state Supreme Court is the final word on state issues. So here's, the, here's that younger abstention doctrine where they say that the law is unconstitutional and they want to file a case in federal court to stop the state court prosecution because it violates, I don't know, say the Fourth Amendment, the illegal search and seizures. The U.S. Supreme Court said, no, we're not going to issue injunctions against state courts because you can raise that federal issue in state court and you have the avenue to have it reviewed by a federal court. Ah, so you always have the avenue. It may not be a right, but if it's important enough, the Supreme Court can hear it and make a final decision. I'll give you an example of a case that was important enough for the U.S. Supreme Court to hear it. How many of y'all have ever heard of Dr. Ira Gore? Gore versus BMW. All right, Gore versus BMW <laughs> was a jury trial, and I think it was here in Jefferson County. It was starting as a Yeah, technically, this building used to be the BMW dealership. So it's hitting a little close to home. Y'all are on the third floor where they used to do the repairs on BMWs and probably paint jobs, too. So Dr. Gore bought a BMW that had paint damage because it had been exposed to acid rain. Y'all remember that? Yep. Yeah, but they didn't tell him that. And well, they didn't tell him that. Well, it was like three percent of the, it was less than three percent of the value of the car. It was about a four thousand dollar paint job. Okay? But they went ahead and did the four thousand dollar paint job and sold him the car as new, and when he found out ah it's been repaired, he thought, I've been defrauded. He wanted to sue and he did. And he sued here in Jefferson County and he got a jury verdict of four million dollars. All the while, BMW is saying punitive damages are unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment because they deprive us of due process. BMW's lawyers argued the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution in the trial court here in Jefferson County. The state court. They argued the U.S. Constitution. They had to. Because you've got to raise your issue and you've got to argue it every court along the way in order to preserve it. So the only way that they were able to get to the U.S. Supreme Court is because they argued the issue all the way up. If you argue it in one court and then give it up in the next court and then try to raise it in the next court, too bad. You failed to raise it as what? So, you have to raise it and you have to argue it every step along the way. Well, the trial court in, in Gore's case said, BMW, I kind of agree with you. I think the $4 million is probably a little excessive. I'm going to cut that down to $2 million. And so Dr. Gore just saw his dollar signs cut in half. And BMW looked at it and said, we still think that's too high. So they appealed it to the Alabama Supreme Court, directly to the Alabama Supreme Court. It's one of those cases where you can do that. And the Alabama Supreme Court says, well, yeah, maybe $2 million is a little high. We'll cut it down to $1 million. And BMW wasn't happy with that either. But they argued that it violated their 14th Amendment rights. They argued that in the trial court, and then they argued it in the Alabama Supreme Court. And then, after the Supreme Court said, we're cutting it to $1 million, BMW said, well, what the heck? Let's file for a petition for writ of certiorari to the U.S. Supreme Court and see if they grant it. This is purely discretionary with the U.S. Supreme Court. 
The U.S. Supreme Court said, okay, we'll hear your case. After the arguments on Ford versus BMW, the U.S. Supreme Court came out and said, yeah, even a million dollars is a little much. Now, that's, that's a trivia question for you. How much do you think Dr. Gore spent in attorney fees? <laughs> in the trial court? That's a trivia question. How much do you think Dr. Kaur spent in attorney fees? Probably, they are probably, they probably, nothing. probably nothing. They yeah. probably took it on contingency. Uh, ah, so these lawyers are working now for free, right? Yeah, they're a big pay they're trying to get to the doctors, the, the lawyers for the doctors saw their attorney fee cut from maybe, let's say, 50% just for numbers. 50% of the $4 million verdict, they were looking at $2 million of attorney fee. They were shaken in their <coughs> shoes because that's $2 million. And then when the trial court cut that to a million, they were like, they had a laundry bill. The judge just cut their fee in half. Now it's not $2 million, it's $1 million. And they're like, well, that's okay, we still got a million. <laughs> And then BMW appeals to the Alabama Supreme Court that cut it down to a million, and now they're down 500,000. <laughs> and then the U.S. Supreme Court came out in court versus BMW and said, you know, we have to have guideposts. That's their big term out of court versus BMW. Guideposts to give us an idea on what is fair and what's not fair on the end of the We think it should be a multiplier, but in no instance should it be more than 10. They said $4,000 paint job, $40,000. So they cut the $1 million down to $40,000. Wow. Because the attorneys argued the 14th Amendment all the way up. And had they not done that, the court couldn't have done that. Ah, uh, but the Supreme Court seemed to come out now with later decisions that said, can't sue people for what they did outside of Alabama. You can't sue them in Alabama for that. It's like uh, the state into the uh, side of the case and the guy goes into the state state farm case out there in Utah. Yeah. And so now they took the four million dollars and cut it down to forty thousand. And if the lawyers got half of that, that's twenty thousand. I guarantee you they spent more than twenty thousand dollars worth of time. They were working for free at some point. Yeah, it wasn't favorable to us. <laughs> All right, so 1257, 1257, it is a discretionary review by certiori from the state's highest court to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's one of the interplays you're going to find between the federal system and the state system is the fact that you have the right to appeal federal issues to the U.S. Supreme Court. Not, no right to appeal. You have the right to request a discretionary review by certiori to the U.S. Supreme Court if you've preserved your federal issue all the way up. Now, the other ones, the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico, you have the right for certiori to the U.S. Supreme Court. The courts of Appeals for the Armed Forces, you can ask for certiori. The key thing is the U.S. Supreme Court picks and chooses the cases that they want to hear because most everything is certiori which is their discretionary review. And it's only two instances. One, an absolute right to appeal by a three-judge district court panel. And the other is original exclusive jurisdiction of actions between two states. That's the only case that they absolutely have to do. Is that a good trivia question? Mm -hmm. Of course it is. All right, the time for appeal or certiori, 2101, Twenty one oh one says if you're going to do an appeal, you've got to do it within thirty days. Your appeals have to be within twenty one days or thirty days to the Supreme Court. By the way, criminal cases are a little shorter. This is civil procedure though, so we're doing civil appeals. All civil cases within 30 days of entry. Of the order. 
Yes, 30 days in the order. And then it throws another one in here, for which I'll draw it on here, but I don't know where the case says that. I want to put appeal other, and it also is 30 days. They pass a statute that says, if there are any other cases to which we give you a right to appeal from the circuit court, if it's an appeal, it's got to be 30 days. So not only from the three-judge panel is 30 days, if there's any appeals from the circuit court, those are also 30 days. I'll tell you this, I've not found one yet. It's just the easiest thing for you to remember that if it's an appeal, it's 30 days. Period, right? Now, in the same code section, 2101, it says, if you're going to apply for a writ of certiorari, how many? 90. You get 90 days for certiorari. that in there 2101 says you have 90 days certiorari. The certiorari is going to be from the courts of appeals or it's going to be from the state's highest court. Now I put state's highest court up there for a reason. In Alabama, Alabama's highest court is called the Supreme Court. But in New York the Supreme Court is actually the trial court, right? I don't remember what they call their highest court. Maybe it's a court of appeals. So by using this generic term, the state's highest court, Congress has said, we don't care what you call it. Whoever has the final word on state law, you have the right to seek certiorari from that court to the U.S. Supreme Court if it happens to be a federal issue that you've preserved all the way up. Any questions about the timing on those things? All right, the next code section is 2106. What it says is that the Supreme Court or any other court of appellate jurisdiction, and what do you think those courts are? Courts of appeals, right? May affirm, modify, vacate, set aside, or reverse <coughs> any judgment, decree, or order of a court lawfully brought before it for review and may remand the cause and direct entry of such appropriate judgment, decree, or order, or require further proceedings to be had as may be just under the circumstances. So when you read these opinions, and, it, and the court says, we affirm, we modify, we vacate, we set aside, or we reverse, do you know why they use those words? Because Congress says those are the words you have to use. It's 2106 that says this is what you can do on the cases. Can they say, we <coughs> scrutinize? That's not in the statute, is it? It's got to be either affirm, modify, vacate, set aside, or reverse. They can still write a really long opinion. Yes, they can write a really long opinion. But technically, all they can do is affirm, modify, vacate, set aside, or reverse. And then they can do that with um, the directory of the directing of the entry of the judgment or to require further proceedings. So, if they reverse and render, what have they done? Okay, think about it. What is rendering the judgment? It's giving the judgment yourself. So if they reverse and render, the court below screwed it up, but it's, it's easy enough to decide that the appellate court says, no judgment should have been entered in favor of this other party. We don't need further proceedings. This is what should have happened on the case of Stark. But if they reverse and remand, they overturn the conviction or a new trial. They over, well, civil. They overturn the judgment. They overturn the judgment. And then they send it back for further proceedings. That's reverse and remand. Remand for further instructions. You'll see a lot of state court cases that says, 
we're going to remand this back to the to the trial court with instructions to give us a return on their remand within 30 days that's where they actually say here's what the judgment is and they send it back up for review but that's the instruction of the support that says send us back what your decision is within 30 days so they would just they would be take the instructions that were given on remand, redo the judgment, and send it back to them. Yes. All right, now, the authority of the federal courts. There is a code section, this applies to all federal courts. In my notes, I just put it in there on each court so I can remind you that the courts have all the authority they need to enforce their orders. The Supreme Court and all courts established by Act of Congress may issue all writs necessary or appropriate in aid of their respective jurisdictions and agreeable to the usages and principles of law. What was that? 20, uh, it's, uh, 1651. And I've got a note like that. They call that the All Writs Act. The court has the authority to issue all writs necessary or appropriate to enforce their orders. Now, I had a criminal trial over in federal court. It ended up lasting 10 days, 10 days of trials. It's a drug conspiracy. We started off with five defendants on Monday, and we got to where we actually struck the jury Monday. We were coming back Tuesday to start the trial. Well, a friend of mine who happens to be the judge out in the trust pool, Carl Chambly, he practices in court when he's not not the sitting judge. He does criminal cases. <coughs> He represented a guy that didn't show up at 9 o'clock. So he got on his phone and called his client and he said, yeah, I had this emergency come up. I had to go to the dentist. And the federal court said, be here at 9. So as soon as he relayed the information that his client wasn't there, wasn't coming because he was at the dentist, the federal judge issued a directive to the U.S. Marshal, technically called the writ. Go out and get him and lock him up. It's called a writ of arrest. And oh, by the way, your trial is not starting today. We'll set you at some point later in time where he sat in jail until his trial. And the court has that authority to do that because of 1651. It gives the courts all the authority to issue to enforce their judgment and authority. And remember, we talked last week about. You have the authority to have a court issue the U.S. Marshals and North to go out and seize their property and sell it. That also is included under this All Writs Act. There was a case. Mr. Francis, we're going to fill this in more if you want to wait to take a picture. At the end? Yeah. I'll give you a chance before I erase it. And anybody else who wants to take a picture of it. By the way, I have a lot of people who turn in this chart for their summary and then go in and fill in the details, and that's okay. Because this chart summarizes a whole lot of what we're covering today. And it's that way on purpose. All right, next, or next. State laws as rules of decision. This is section 1252. Just listen for this, listen to this for a minute. The laws of the several states except where the Constitution or treaties of the United States or Act of Congress otherwise require or provide, shall be regarded as rules of decision in civil actions in the court of the United States in cases where they apply. Does that sound anything like your reading assignment? What does it sound like? The Erie Doctrine. It sounds like the Erie Doctrine, doesn't it? So, <clears throat> we're going to come back to that. Just let you know that the Erie Doctrine has actually got a statute for it. That's what, 28 U.S.C. 1252? 1652. Sorry, 1652. 21.04, Review of State Court Decisions. A review by the Supreme Court of the judgment or decree of the State Court shall be conducted in the same manner and under the same regulations and shall have the same effect as if the judgment or decree review had been rendered in any court of the United States. Was that 2104. What it says is that the Supreme Court is going to use the same 
rules <coughs> and review of state judgments as it does for federal judgments. Does that make life easy on the federal court? Harmless error, 2111. They are not going to reverse a case because of harmless error. So what do you think a harmless error is? Like something that doesn't affect the outcome. I like typos. It doesn't affect the outcome. It doesn't affect the outcome, and it doesn't affect the rights of the parties. So if it's harmless, they're not going to reverse it, no matter how hard you try. <coughs> All right, that takes care of the Supreme Court. Now we start in with the circuit courts. No, not next week. We've got to push through this this week. Next week is state courts. All right, Section 41. 28 U.S.C. Section 41 says that there are 13 judicial circuits in the United States. You want to guess what they are? First circuit, second circuit, third circuit, fourth circuit on my diagram. I've got first, second, and third in the boxes. Ellipses between. The ellipses rec represent the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth. Back to my next box, the eleventh circuit. The D.C. circuit. And the federal circuit. Now I've got all of my circuit courts labeled or at least represented on this chart. What fiction did you say? 41. 41, thank you. 41 says that there are going to be these circuits, and then 43 says, oh, by the way, now that we've decided what the circuits are, we're going to create a court in each one. Mm -hmm. So 41 is the circuits, 43 is the creation of the court. Remember that we said they have to spell it out because Congress creates the courts and then they have to declare the chain of command and everything else. So these are the statutes that do that. As it turns out, what you need to know for this class is prior to October 1st of 1981, there used to be only 12 circuits. One through 10, and then D.C. and federal. On October 1st of 1981, Congress passed a law that says, okay, now we're going to have the 11th circuit. So now, and that's us. So now we have 1 through 11 plus the D.C. and the Federal Circuit. Back, it's probably been 20, close to 25 years ago, but at least 20 because I was teaching civil procedure. <coughs> we were on vacation down in Florida and it was raining outside so I was scanning through the <coughs> channels and ran across CNN. Actually, I think it was C-SPAN. It was C-SPAN. And there was an argument going on in Congress about whether or not they should create a 12th judicial circuit. The 12th judicial circuit. What they were talking about is taking California out of the ninth and making it its own circuit. And it was Jeff Sessions who happened to be doing the talking, if anybody's interested. And they decided not to do that. We still have just 13 circuits. October 1st of 1981, the 11th circuit was created. The 11th circuit is Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. 41 says this is what the 11th circuit is. The 5th circuit now under 41 is Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Back before October 1st of 81, the 5th circuit was Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida. And so it split the circuit. In your practice, you're going to need to know that the 11th Circuit used to be part of the 5th. Because the precedent from the 5th Circuit prior to October 1st of 1981 is binding precedent in the 11th Circuit. Yeah, sure. the, last part <coughs> the, the precedent, the cases from the 5th Circuit prior to October 1st of 1981 is binding precedent on the 11th Circuit. <coughs> uh huh. That's exactly why. Is that why when you're doing blue book citations and you have to go back and make sure it's good law? 
if you're if you're researching law in the 11th circuit and you get to October 1st of 1981 and that's as far back as you can go you got to go back and research the 5th circuit because if they've rendered a decision on that issue it's still binding precedent on the 11th circuit. Can you name those states again? You said Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. Texas. Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi are the 5th now. But what you really need to know is the 11th, which is Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. Now, <clears throat> with that, 44 says how many judges there are. The 11th Circuit actually has 12 circuit court judges. 45 says that there's a chief judge. Remember, we talked about that. There's a chief justice at, at the Supreme Court level. Well, at the circuit court level, they're going to have a chief judge. That's section 45. And then they're going to have a chief judge in the district court, which is another section we'll get to in a minute. What that person does is the administrative duties for the court. So know that there's just one that has to handle the administrative duties. 46 is the next important section you need to know, and it's the assignment of judges, panels, hearings, and quorums. Circuit judges shall sit on the court and its panels in such order and such time as the court directs. So what you've got is every case that goes up for review by the uh, by the appellate courts instead of getting all 12 judges to decide your case you're only going to get three judges the three judge panel and that's for all circuit court cases <laughs> all circuit court cases are going to be decided initially by a three judge panel and not only that, but at least a majority of those have to actually be from that circuit. Now I had one where I had two judges from the 11th Circuit and a district court judge sitting by designation from the state of Missouri. So he was participating on my panel and I had to explain to, to the judges, here's what the law is in the 11th Circuit because He's used to the whatever circuit Missouri's out of. And I'm sure that's something the judges discussed. <coughs> and then the three judges reach a decision, and that's the decision of your appeal. You only get a three judge panel. Now, the 11th Circuit precedent about panel decisions I found a case for you that says. While we are not permitted to reach a result contrary to a prior panel's decision, merely because we are convinced it's wrong, we must reach a contrary result where the prior panel decision is itself inconsistent with the earlier ones. That's why you got to know that the Fifth Circuit is binding precedent on the Eleventh. This is but another way of saying that where two or more decisions of the court are inconsistent, we follow the earliest one. So they actually tell you what the priority is on their decisions. Once a three-judge panel reaches a decision on what the law is based on a certain set of facts, if it's first impression, they make that decision and the circuit has to continue to follow that in all future decisions. Yes, ma'am. H-U-R-T-H versus Mitchum, who's the warden. And I only have the docket case number for you. If you want that, just email me separate. This is not part of your reading. This is just giving you an idea about why the circuit panels decide cases the way they do. So if they have a panel decision which has already been decided on an issue, they have to follow that panel's decision. But if they find two panel decisions that are inconsistent, they have to follow the first panel, which is the first one to reach the issue. What's that? What is that rule set up that they're trying to say here? 
case law is precedent. It's precedent. Whenever you make a decision on first impression, you're going to continue to follow that. And oh, by the way, if we screwed up and didn't follow it one time, we meant to, so we'll go back and follow the first one. That's them giving a clear rule of precedent. This next case, which is Atlantic Sounding Company versus Townsend, the court says, under our prior panel precedent rule, a later panel may depart from an earlier panel's decision only when the intervening Supreme Court decision is clearly on point. Okay, the Supreme Court makes a decision. Does the panel follow its decision? Or if the Supreme Court has clearly on point overturned it, who do you think they have to follow? They got to follow the Supreme Court. But in order to do that, it has to be clearly on point. So you've got to find a case that's clearly on point to overturn a prior panel decision. Um, the Supreme Court reminds us that there is, of course, an important difference between a holding in a case and the reasoning that supports the holding. Y'all know what the reasoning that supports the holding is called? Crap. No. It's called the ratio descendi supposed to be the rationale of the decision. Ratio descendi. So that the reasoning of an intervening high court decision is at odds with the prior panel decision is no basis for the panel to depart. As we have stated, obedience to a Supreme Court decision is one thing. Extrapolating from its implications a holding on an issue that was not before the court in order to upend settled law is another. That's what they mean by it has to be clearly on point. What have they said here? They're going to distinguish the crap out of cases, right? That's exactly what it's saying. We're going to distinguish cases. Y'all heard distinguishing cases? That's the 11th Circuit decision, panel decision. And then these are the ones, the 11th Circuit prior panel from the 5th Circuit, that's Bonner versus City of Pritchard. That's one case that you'll probably use frequently if you do appellate law. 661 F2D 1206. And it says prior decisions of the 5th Circuit before October 1st of 81 is binding precedent on the 11th. Now, what happens if you get past your three panel decision and you lose? Is your case over? Yeah, the three panel, the three judge panel in the circuit court decides, oh, you lose your case. <coughs> Is your case over? Well, you already know you have certiorari as an option, right? But that's discretionary with <coughs> the Supreme Court. Right? So it may not be over. It may not be over. <coughs> Is a three judge panel decision a decision of the entire court? Oh, it's three judges. You have the right to request a rehearing before the entire court. Now, they don't have to grant it, but you have the right to ask for it. And that's called a rehearing en banc, V-A-N-C. Rehearing en, E-N, and then the last word is banc, V-A-N-C. The Sixth Circuit used to call it en banc, I-N. A-N-C. But I think they've changed it now so that everybody's the same. N. N. Bonk. E N. And then B A N C. So would you wait for that review before you file your certiorari? Yes. You ask for your rehearing before you ask for certiorari. Now, your rehearing in Bonk is to see if you can convince a majority of the judges in the entire court to hear your case rather than just a three judge panel. For the entire court to make a decision whether or not this is binding precedent. As it turns out, a three judge panel's decision can be overturned by the entire court. Or it can be overturned by a Supreme Court case which is directly on point. 
you all should have gotten all that out of your legal research. Did you all get that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hey, when we talk about chain of command for the federal courts, you need to know these things. When you get to the circuit court, you have the right to appeal, but your right to appeal is going to be three judges making the decision on your case. If it's not satisfactory to you, you have the right to request a rehearing before the entire court. The entire court's going to take a vote on whether or not they want to make a decision on your case by the entire court. In this case, the 11th Circuit is going to be 12 different judges from the 11th Circuit versus probably two judges from the 11th Circuit and a judge from somewhere else. Why do you think they ask a judge from somewhere else to sit on panels? How about cross-training? If it's a district court judge and you get them involved in participating in circuit panel decisions, aren't you preparing for them to be placed as a circuit court judge? They differ in various circuits. As an example, by statute, section 44, there are six judges in the first circuit. There are 13 in the second. There are 14 in the third, 15 in the fourth. Congress passes laws to how many they have, and then once they get appointed, they're in there for life, right? So are they based on the judges on population or something? either population or based on the workload of the court. The Administrative Office Court in Washington, D.C. actually keeps statistics. Remember those cover sheets we talked about last week? For every case that's filed, they get these in and they see how many cases are civil rights cases, how many are, are diversity cases, and they say, well, there's this many. And as an example here in Alabama, these judges hear a couple hundred cases a month. And out here in um, California, they hear 600 a month. Well, maybe they're being overworked. If we give them another judge, then we drop the 600 a month down to 300 a month. And they're traveling judges. They travel the circuit. They travel the, the 11th Circuit, by the way, is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. And it looks like a castle. <laughs> it's over on Pryor Street. Y'all know why it looks like a castle? <laughs> because the court is their kingdom. <laughs> yeah, they got dibs. Yeah, you know yes. um, when you request a rehearing in bond, you get to present your case to the court before they decide whether or not they're going to hear what they do, which is based off. <laughs> when you ask for a rehearing in bond, you file actual paperwork at the court to try to entice at least a majority of judges that this decision needs to be reached and that it's wrong by the panel. And so, yes, it's it's a persuasive argument you file with the court, but they're going to vote to see whether or not you're going to have enough judges to say, yeah, we need to hear it. Yes? So Madison County is the 23rd Judicial Circuit within that, the 11th Circuit, that's, that's state, state court. Okay. That's state court. Okay. Madison County, as we'll get to here in a minute when we get down to, down. to the district courts, it's actually in the Northern District of Alabama. All right, any questions so far? Um, disqualification of a trial judge to hear an appeal? No judge that tried the case should hear the appeal. No, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 47. It's over those three panels, those judges that served on the three panels that heard your initial appeal, they would be able to set it wrong to hear your appeal again. One, they didn't try the case, they heard the appeal. There's a difference between trial judge and appellate judge. <coughs> yes, they are going to be on the, the end box because at least two of them are going to be part of the court, maybe even three. All right, let's get back to our drawing diagram. <coughs> All right, I am drawing a line from our our sole district court that we've got down here on the bottom left hand corner of our uh, of our diagram. And I'm going to actually call it district court. <laughs> Under 1291, 
says the courts of appeals shall have jurisdiction of appeals from all final decisions of the district courts of the United States. Say it again. The courts of appeals shall have appellate jurisdiction of all appeals from final decisions of district courts. Now it also has, uh, except as otherwise provided by law, because if it's a three-judge panel, that appeal goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. But other than that, all final decisions of district courts go to circuit courts. That's the chain of command link. What number was that? 1291. And when you take an appeal, the very first thing you have to put in your appeal is, this court has the duty to hear this case pursuant to section 1291 because you have to hear appeals from final court decisions from the district court. Remember that jurisdictional environment? There it is. The court has to hear this case because it's a final judgment from the district court. Is that also 42 days? It's not 42 days. How long did we say you have appeals in? 30. We're coming back to that. Um, 1291 is final decisions. 1292, interlocutory. Well, if it's not final, what is it? Twelve ninety two. Thank you. Twelve ninety two is interlocutory, twelve ninety one is final. So basically Congress has said it doesn't matter what the district court did, if you're going to appeal from them at all, you're going to appeal to the circuit court. Does that make sense? So what is a final judgment? That's it. Yeah, you've got to know this because if you're going to tell the court you have the duty to hear this case pursuant to, you need to know what a final judgment is. Final judgment takes care of all issues and all parties. There is nothing else pending before the court for it to make a decision on. That is a final judgment. And if you have one of those from the U.S. District Court, you do your appeal pursuant to 1291. If the court has not decided all the issues or has not taken care of all the parties, it's not a final judgment. We call that interlocutory because the case is still pending. <coughs> and you have the right to appeal interlocutory decisions pursuant to 1292. So the court made a partial decision, like decided certain things? Yes. Oh, okay. That's exactly what it is. They decided certain things. All right, 1294. Circuits in which decisions are reviewable. Appeals from reviewable decisions of the district and territorial courts shall be taken to the courts of appeals as follows. Number one, from a district court of the United States to the court of appeals for the circuit embracing the district. The circuit embracing the district. All right, so if the 11th Circuit is defined as all courts, all federal courts in the states of Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, and you have a decision from the United States District Court for the Northern District of Alabama, where do you file your appeal? Atlanta. <coughs> Atlanta to the 11th Circuit. Because the 11th Circuit includes Alabama, which includes the Northern District of Alabama. It's the circuit which encompasses the district. Now, it has other things on here about um, the district of the Canal Zone goes to the 5th Circuit, Virgin Islands to the 3rd, and Guam goes to the 9th. You're not going to be tested on those. But know that each territory is assigned a specific court to go to. And in general, it's the circuit which encompasses the district from which you are taking your appeal. That's kind of common sense, isn't it? <laughs> but Congress has to pass a law that says that because Congress created those courts. Time for, for your appeals, 2107. I 
need blue. To be consistent with our chart, I need blue. Appeals are 30 days. That's 2107. Generally speaking, they're 30 days. However, in 60 days, if the United States government is party, that's still 2107. So 30 days generally, 60 days if the United States is a party. Now, why do you think the United States government needs 60 days to file an appeal? <laughs> they are slow. <laughs> That's a good answer. They are slow. How about this? Red tape. How about this? Bureaucracy. Go in the blank, whatever you want to put. They give the United States government 60 days. No, oh, by the way, if you happen to be one of the parties where the U.S. government is one of the parties, you also have 60 days. So in any case in which the U.S. government is a party, 60 days to appeal. Now, I saw a case not too long ago on that where uh, it was a, a key TAM action. They were suing on behalf of the government and you'll, you'll get later on this semester the key town. The government can be a party to a case if it's on behalf of the government. This is where you're suing for like $600 toilet seats. But that's not the real cost to make them. So you sue on behalf of the government for the contractor over, overcharging for the seats. And the case was on behalf of the government, but the government didn't want to become a party. They said, no, you just can't work. And they tried to argue, well, we get 60 days because the government was a party to our case. And the court said, no, the government technically wasn't a party. They had the right to join, but they didn't. So therefore, your appeal time is only 30 days. And they lost their appeal because they didn't file it within the 30 days. All right, there's other provisions in 2107 that are a lot like Rule 6 that we discussed last <coughs> week. And that is, if you want an extension of time, you need to ask for it when? Before it expires, right? And then if the clerk's office didn't send you a copy of the order and you didn't find out about it in time, you have 21 days to ask for extra time. That's in there too, but it's not the jurisdictional part that says you have to meet these times or the court doesn't have the jurisdiction to hear the case. All right, the same thing about the determinations. The courts of appeals have the same rights to either affirm, reverse, vacate, all those same words that we talked about before in 2106 and 2111, harmless error, <clears throat> you're not going to get a court reversed on harmless error. And now we get to the district courts. We've taken our appeal from the district court to the circuit court pursuant to 2107, it's 30 days, and it's 1291 if it's a final judgment, 1292 if it's interlocutory. So now Congress has to go in and by statute create all the districts. And there's like 92 or 94 different <coughs> districts. Or 94 different districts in the United States. Um, the first one, 28 U.S.C. Section 81, is Alabama. Alabama is divided into three districts. The northern, the middle, and the southern district. Can you say number again? I'm sorry. 81. 81A is Alaska. Arizona is 82, Arkansas is 83, California is 84. Yeah, it's alphabetical, folks. The only reason Alaska is the only reason Alaska stuck in there at 81A is because they first set it up before Alaska was a state. And then when Alaska became a state, they said, well, alphabetically it fits in between Alabama and Arizona. So they said, okay, A1A is Alaska. So if you need to know about the districts for any state, go to 81 through 131. 131 is Wyoming. And, uh, and I bet Hawaii is stuck in there too with a the letter on the end of it. I did not put that in my notes. 
Now, one of the things you've got to be careful of is not only do you have to file it in proper district court, but you also have to follow it, file your action in the proper division of the district. And Section 85 says that there are seven different divisions within the Northern District of Alabama. Now, I don't test you on these, and I've never seen the bar exam test you on it either. But districts are fair game. So you've got to know that there's three districts in Alabama, the northern, the middle, and the southern. Where's the northern headquarters? Birmingham. The northern is headquartered in Birmingham. Where's the middle headquarters? Montgomery. Montgomery. Where's the southern? Mobile. Mobile. Yeah. So you need to know that at least for my exam. Birmingham, Montgomery, and Mobile. <clears throat> the middle district has three different divisions and the southern has two. The northern and the southern. Division of the southern district. The southern has two. The middle has three and the northern has seven. Remember, there's only like two or three federal judges in district court for the middle and southern. Actually, there's three. And there's seven of them assigned to the northern district. Cool. So that tells me that there's more than twice as many cases in the northern as there are in the middle and the southern. All right, so 81 breaks Alabama up into three districts and then multiple divisions for each district. 132, right after Wyoming, says that there's going to be a judicial district court in each judicial district. So you create the district and then you create the court in the district. Remember, they still got to build their chain of command. <clears throat> the president shall appoint by and with the advice and consent of Senate district judges for several districts as follows. And then, like I said, we have seven in the northern, three in the middle, three in the southern. Yes? I got a question for you. Yes, Chloe. When you test us on this, are you just going to put like the rule, any one, and then blank? No. <laughs> no, I'm, if I ask you a question on it, I'm going to ask you a question that says, where would you appeal from the Northern District of Alabama? Or maybe the Middle District. Where would you appeal to? Oh, you're not saying like yeah, okay. Atlanta. Atlanta. You'd appeal to the 11th Circuit. Yeah. All right. <laughs> tenure, yeah, tenure and residence of uh, district judges. Judges have hold office during good behavior. Sounds just like Article 3, Section 1. Last sentence of 1, I think. So they can't be inconsistent with that. And except for some places around New York, the judges have to actually have to live in the district in which they're judges. Chief judge, there's a chief judge at the district court level. 144 is where you allege that a judge has bias or prejudice. And that's where you file a motion to recuse. And you can actually do that in any of the courts, but most likely it's, it's the district court. So I include that with you there. Now we get to the important stuff. The subject matter jurisdiction of the federal trial courts. There is a series of code sections starting at 1330 and going through at least 1367, which defines all the different types of cases which the federal district courts have the jurisdiction to hear. 1330 is actions against foreign states. That's one of the exceptions to the rule. You know that it's in the Constitution that says foreign states, right? Well, if you want to sue a foreign state, then you would tell the trial court, I'm bringing this pursuant to 1330. But out of all of these, 1330 through 1367, there's three that you really need to know. And so write down these three in your notes. Now I've got to change back to green.
1331 says the district court shall have original jurisdiction of all civil actions arising under the constitutional laws or treaties of the United States. There is a nickname for this code section. It's called Federal Question. It is a federal question if it arises under the federal constitution, the federal laws, or federal treaties. So it has original jurisdiction? It has original jurisdiction. Now, it doesn't say exclusive, does it? You want to know why it doesn't say exclusive? Because you can bring those actions in state court. So you get to pick federal or state court. They are courts of concurrent jurisdiction. <coughs> when a client comes into your office, you can pick whether or not you want to go to federal or state court. Now, y'all stop taking notes for a minute. Listen. The district court shall have original jurisdiction of all civil actions arising under the Constitution, laws, or treaties of the United States. That's the code section. How much does your case have to be worth if it's a federal question? It's got to be worth at least a dollar. Right? But do you have to have a minimum claim for a federal question? The statute says nothing about how much your claim has to be. It's merely whether or not it's a federal question. Now, yes, you've got to have at least a dollar to be in a lawsuit. That's called nominal damages. But is there a minimum amount for you to bring a federal claim? The answer is no. <coughs> now, on your notes that you turn in for this week, I want you to turn in only your notes for this week. Don't give me last week's notes mixed in with this week's. I want you to keep them separate. And the reasons I want you to keep them separate will become very clear to you probably by next week. And that is, when you have a federal court to hear a case and it's federal question jurisdiction, it doesn't matter what the dollar amount is. Diversity, it does. So if you're doing federal question, you don't have to have a dollar amount. It's not part of the test. The test is, does it arise under the Constitution, laws, or treaties of the United States? If the answer is yes, the federal court can hear it. The next one is going to be diversity. If it's diversity, the federal court can hear it. The state courts, however, are usually based on dollar amounts. Whatever court you pick in the state court has to be based on how much the claim is worth. The federal question doesn't have that test. I'm trying to get this to you. That the test that you're building for each of these to see if there's federal court jurisdiction, the tests for federal courts are apples. <coughs> the tests for state courts are oranges. Keep them separate. Just like this week and next week for subject matter jurisdiction, you're going to have tests for personal jurisdiction. Those are peaches. Keep your peaches together. <laughs> separate from your oranges and separate from your apples. Peaches is personal jurisdiction. <laughs> this week it is. I'm telling you, just keep your notes separate. Because if I ask you a question about jurisdiction, your response to me should be, are you talking about subject matter or personal? Aha, caught it. And then if I ask you a question about subject matter jurisdiction, you need to say, is that federal court or state court? Aha, you caught that one too. Federal court, subject matter jurisdiction. What are the tests? Number one, federal question. If you have a federal question, then you have the right to have your case heard in federal court regardless of dollar amount. Number two, 1332 called diversity of citizenship. Diversity of citizenship says the district court shall have original jurisdiction in all civil actions where the matter in controversy exceeds the sum or value of $75,000, exclusive of interest and cost, and is between citizens of different states. Or, citizens of the state and citizens are subjects of the foreign state. Or, citizens of different states in which the citizens or subjects of foreign states are additional parties, or a foreign state. So that literally is your test for diversity. It's two parts. It's dollar value and 
citizenship. And your citizenship can be, number one, parties of different states, a party of one state and a foreigner, party of one state and a foreign country, or party of one state where foreign states are additional parties. So we can remember that by what's going down at the border right now. Yes, if they're foreigners, there's diversity, right? As long as the claim's worth more than $75,000, it has to be in excess of $75,000. Exclusive of interest and cost. Now, let me give you an example of how to figure that out. I've got a breach of contract case. I've got an Alabama resident suing a Georgia resident for breach of a commercial lease, $25,000 a month. Three months that they're delinquent and the contract provides that they owe one percent per month as interest for each month that they're behind so if I sue it as soon as the third month is due the first month is two months behind the second month is a month behind and the third month is just now due right not behind any so I'm suing for three months worth of rent payments twenty five thousand a month how much does that total? $75,000. Plus $750 worth of interest. Can I file it in federal court? No. I can't. It says in excess of $75,000, exclusive of interest and cost. Then you wait till the fourth month and you got it. That's a trick question. <laughs> but you got to know that it exceeds seventy-five thousand dollars. <laughs> it could be on the test. Exclusive of interest. Exclusive of interest and costs. C O S T S. That's the lesson to learn out of, out of exclusive of interest and costs. Is you can't count your interest to meet your claim. You've got to count them separate. Yes. In that example, if you had a light fee, it had nothing to do with interest. If it's a fee and it's not interest then you can count it. But I said that this was interest. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not a cost. So no, it's a fee. What is the cost? Court cost. Oh, okay, okay. Whenever they say cost, it's usually referring to court cost, which is like your filing fee. You can't add your filing fee on top and bring it above $75,000. And you also can't use interest to do it either. So now, let's change the facts. If it's $26,000 a month, with $260 late, interest every month. Can I now file it in federal court? Yes. yes. It's now $78,000. It's now seventy-eight, not seventy-five, and that's in excess of seventy-five, and it's between Alabama and Georgia residents. Everybody got that? So if the, if the congregate just read like $25,000 a month, and then a uh, late fee of $250 If it's month. a late fee, you can count it. If it's interest, you can't. So you got to know that it's interest and costs that, that can cannot be included. Now let's talk about diversity. Diversity, in terms of civil actions, has to be pure diversity. And what I mean by pure diversity is y'all y'all seen cases cited as plaintiff v defendant, right? Yeah. I want to talk about size of the v. Plaintiffs on one side of the v, defendants on the other side. In pure diversity, no plaintiff can be from the same state as any defendant. That's what pure diversity is. Under 1332. Under 1332, for an ordinary civil case, you have to have pure diversity, which means no plaintiff can be from the same state as any defendant. So if I've got an Alabama resident suing a Georgia resident, I've got that because it's Alabama and Georgia. Can I have an Alabama resident suing both a Georgia and a Florida resident? Yes, three and six. Georgia and Florida are still different from Alabama. I've got Florida and Georgia on one side of the V, Alabama on the other. Can I have an Alabama and Georgia resident to a Florida resident? Yes. 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 Can I have an Alabama and Georgia resident to a Georgia and Florida resident? No. 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 Right. Because Georgia's common on both sides of the V. That's what pure diversity is. Now, it changes later in 1332 if you're talking about class action. Class actions have to be more than $5 million. 
and then you need only simple diversity. Not pure diversity, but simple diversity. Is it more than how much? Which means five. five million. And for that, the test is whether or not any single plaintiff is from the same state as any single defendant. Because if any of them are from, you know, that's none of them are from the same. As long as you have at least one person that's different from the others, then you have simple diversity. And the idea is that they want every class action lawsuit to go to federal court because they think federal courts are fairer than state courts. So as long as you've got at least one person from a different state as another person on a class action lawsuit, more than $5 million, you can file it in federal court. Everybody got that? That's the exception to the rule on pure diversity. I really want you to know the pure diversity. Now the last one that we want to cover that's specific to this chart is 1367. 1367 is called supplemental jurisdiction. <laughs> Supplemental jurisdiction has historically in your case law been ancillary claims and ancillary proceedings and pendant state claims. You know what a pendant state claim is? It's an attached claim. So if you have a federal question case and then you add a, uh, another one that happens to be a state claim, the federal court wouldn't have independent jurisdiction to hear the state claim, but they do because you're already there because of a federal question. So that's a pendant state claim. Ancillary proceedings, if you've already got jurisdiction in the court for one case, then you can add another claim to it. That's ancillary. And then we get into um, aggregation. Aggregation, how, how do you determine whether or not your claim exceeds seventy five thousand dollars. If it's a if it's a common and undivided interest between two plaintiffs, then both of their claims together if it's aggregated. If it's common and undivided interest between the entire settlement or the entire amount, then the federal court will allow you to add those together. But if the plaintiff plaintiff A has a separate claim from plaintiff B that's not common, you can't add them together. Each plaintiff has to meet the jurisdictional limit of in excess of $75,000. <coughs> You're going to run across that in your reading assignment. <coughs> now, back to supplemental. Supplemental is what I like to call a piggyback provision. You can add any other claims you want to to your case as long as the court's got jurisdiction to hear at least one of your claims. Do you have to amend the complaint or file a new complaint? You can file it all together at the first time. Okay. And under your complaint for your first claim, you say this court has jurisdiction to hear this case because it's a federal question. And you put down 1331. And then on count two, you say, well, this claim is brought pursuant to supplemental 1367 because I have to make the independent jurisdictional limits. However, because I've already filed a federal question, I can add as many other claims as I have. Or you can do that if it happens to be a state law claim that you're bringing under diversity. So now, real quick, Erie Doctrine. Y'all read that, right? Yes. Did y'all understand what it is and when it applies? State laws, and federal federal court. Court. State laws and federal court is what it says. When you have a diversity case, federal court has to use state law to decide diversity cases. That's what Erie says. Now, what does it mean? All right, let's go by what, what it doesn't mean. If I file a lawsuit in federal court under under federal question jurisdiction, what law is the what law is the court going to apply to the federal question? Federal law. Federal law. But if I'm filing a case under diversity, what kind of claim am I making? Civil rights happens to be a federal question. Forty two USC nineteen eighty three. It's a federal law. So civil rights is not it. If I file a lawsuit in federal court under federal question, it's going to rise under the constitutional laws and treaties in the United States. If I file it under diversity, state law. it's a state law claim, right? Did y'all get that? Yeah. 
voice. Because if it was a federal law claim, I'd file it as a federal question. But if it's diversity, it's going to be a state law claim. Can you give us an example of diversity? Like diverse? The breach of contract or run of rent, $25,000 a month. Okay. Breach of contracts in Alabama cause of action, right? Unless it's a federal contract, then it'd be federal law. But this is a simple commercial lease under Alabama law. I bring it against a citizen of Georgia. I'm bringing what type, what type of claim under diversity, and it's a state claim. So what law should the federal court use to decide a state law claim, which is under diversity? State law. Now does Erie make more sense? It's not, it has nothing to do with the fact that this is diversity, even though that's the terms they put it in. The actual law is, if you bring a state law claim in federal court, we're going to use state law to decide the case. It just happens to be between people in two different states. state law conflicts with federal rules of procedure? Unless it conflicts with procedure, you apply the federal rules of procedure in federal court, the state rules of procedure in state court. Now, we've got the chart completed. That is the complete hierarchy of the federal court from Supreme Court down to circuit courts down to district courts. You've got the jurisdiction of each one. The courts of appeals are only appeals. That's why they call them the court of appeals. The district courts are the trial courts. They're the courts of original jurisdiction. And sometimes the Supreme Court is too if it's between two states. And then the U.S. Supreme Court has to hear those two state cases and appeals from three U.S. panels and then everything else is discretionary, which is certiorari, and those are dashed lines on the chart where it's discretionary. Solid lines of the chart where you have the absolute right to have the court hear your case. Any questions about the federal court? You've got a reading assignment this week. It includes those sections out of 20, uh, Title 28, but those are the ones we covered in class. We've got notes on them. If you just happen to want to read the other code sections in there too, like 82 for Arkansas, 83 for Arizona, more power to you. <laughs> I'm, interested in, I'm interested in 81, and then 132 that says there's a district court in every district. And 1530. And 1330 and, and 1334 through 66. If you want to read those, that's great. I'll tell you, the United States is a plaintiff and the United States is a defendant. There's two of those. Bankruptcy is one of those. So, all right, no questions. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, everybody.